Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. This episode is called When UFOs Land and Humanoids Come Out. I have 10 cases which I've taken from all over the world over a long period of time. We're talking decades, all the way back to the 1940s actually, and moving on towards the present day. And again, from all over the world. And by that I mean the United States, of course, South America, Australia, all across Europe, Italy, Spain, France, Scotland, uh, Norway, England, uh, maybe a few other places. So yeah, very much all across this planet. And in every single one of these cases, witnesses watched UFOs land on the ground and humanoids exit. Many of these cases do involve multiple witnesses. Virtually all of them have some sort of evidence to them. So we have the full spectrum of physical evidence that is often reported, or close to it. And by that I mean certainly landing traces, but also physiological effects, animal reactions, electromagnetic effects, psychological and emotional psychic reactions so really some interesting evidence to a lot of these cases also some of these cases do have apparent government involvement so there's some really unique and unusual aspects to a lot of these cases i think they provide some really good insights into the nature of the ufo phenomenon and extraterrestrials, their agenda on our planet, and so forth. So that's why I chose these 10 cases, all of which are quite extensive. And this is going to be a pretty big episode, so I'm going to move quickly along and get started with the first case. And the first case occurred in Pitanga, Brazil. I like this case because it's a very early case well before humanoids were being widely reported, well before landings were being widely reported. It's also got some really interesting aspects to it, as we shall see. It was on July 23rd, 1947. Now this is right on the heels of the Kenneth Arnold sighting and the Roswell UFO crash in New Mexico. There was a huge super wave of UFO activity sweeping across the United States and the world. And this is when Jose C. Higgins, a topographer, was walking through a field in Patanga, Brazil, when he heard a high-pitched whistling sound coming from above. He looked up and saw a sight that he said raised the hair on his head. Coming down for a landing, he saw a, quote, strange circular airship with protruding edges absolutely similar to those of a drug capsule. As he says, the strange craft crossed over the field in a close circle and landed softly about 150 feet away from where I stood. Now, Jose wasn't alone when this happened. He was with a whole crew of other uh, workers, but all of them became frightened. They scattered and ran away, but Jose himself was very curious and remained to see what would happen. And he said that this object was about 150 feet wide and about 15 feet high, so pretty big. As he says, it was crossed by tubes in several directions, but there was no smoke or fire, only that odd sound coming from the tubes. So, as he watched this craft, you know, landed on these flexible metal landing legs, he said the craft itself was metallic, gray-white in color, and he saw a porthole that looked like it was made of thick glass, and through it he saw two strange people looking out through the porthole right at him. Uh, here's a representation of what he saw. He says one of them turned away and shortly later a door hissed open and three of them came out they were wearing a sort of inflated spacesuit with little backpacks on their back. And he described them as having large hairless heads, very large round eyes. He says their legs were abnormally large. And in fact, the men reached a height of about seven feet. 
He said they all looked so similar to each other that they could have been twins or siblings. This is a feature we see in a lot of these ET accounts. One of them was carrying a strange sort of tube-like device in his hand, and he also noticed that they seemed to avoid the sunlight and remained mostly in the shadow of the craft. But he said they were absolutely beautiful in appearance. As Jose says in his own words, I will never know if they were men or women. Despite the characteristics I described, they were somehow beautiful and appeared in excellent health. Now they were speaking audibly, he believes. They were speaking in a strange foreign language. And despite being very large in you know, body size, they moved very quickly. And when they saw him, they formed, three of them, a triangular position around him. And the one holding the tube motioned for Jose to approach the door of the craft, which he did. And looking inside, Jose says that he saw what appeared to be a small entry chamber with round beams sort of protruding along the edge. So he attempted to communicate with them, asking them where they came from, um, using his own language and gestures as well. Uh, the men did seem to understand him, and one of them actually grabbed a stick and bent down and drew a round spot on the sand and seven circles around it and pointed to the sun and then to the seventh circle, apparently in an attempt to explain their place of origin, saying that it was the seventh planet. This is speculation from the UFO researchers who looked into this case, but this is what Jose described. So he became frightened at this point that they were going to take him away, and he devised a little method to sort of trick them, he thought. He quickly pulled out a photograph of his wife from his wallet and tried to make them understand that he wanted to go get her before going along with them. Of course, he had no intention of doing this. This was just a ruse by him to get away, uh, which apparently worked, or perhaps they weren't even trying to get him at all. At any rate, he walked off into the trees and watched them from a distance. And this is when he was amazed to see that they began playing around like children, jumping up into the air, picking up very large stones and throwing them around. And they did this actually for about a half hour and then promptly returned into the craft. The door closed, that strange whistling sound returned, and this craft moved straight up at first and then off into the clouds. So this whole experience was so bizarre that Jose didn't know quite what to think. As he says, was it a dream? Was it real? Sometimes I doubt that these things can happen. And then I think, that if it was not for the workers together with me in the beginning, it might have been a strange and fascinating dream. So yeah, lucky for him, he did have other witnesses. I really feel for people who are alone when they have their UFO encounters because they go through this whole sort of doubt about the whole experience. And certainly he seems to have felt some of that. I think you'll agree that is quite an unusual case. I find it very interesting that the witness said that these entities, these apparent ETs, were very beautiful, but that he wasn't able to determine their gender, whether they were male or female. I also thought the way they acted was very interesting in this playful manner, and jumping around like this planet had less gravity, perhaps, than their own planet. That is, of course, pure speculation, but it's certainly very interesting. But let's move to the next case. And the next case occurred in actually Australia. This is in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia. This is also an interesting case. This does involve only one witness to the entity, but two witnesses to the actual UFO. And what I like about this case is the entity described is quite unusual, its appearance. And also, some of the things it did, I don't think I've heard more than just a few times. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to include this case. This case comes from Australian researcher Bill Chalker and occurred in August of 1960. The main witness's name is Helen Aldridge. And it was around 1.30 a.m. 
when she was woken up in her bedroom by a buzzing noise coming from outside her home. This is again in the Belmont suburb of Newcastle in New South Wales, Australia. So she got up, looked out the window, and there, resting on the ground, only 60 feet away from her, was what she described as a, quote, bright round object, not unlike a large musical top. So this is a somewhat unusual shape of a UFO, but certainly not unheard of. She says that there was a light on top of the object that, quote, rotated and projected a yellowish white beam, illuminating the paddock, house, and garden as it swept around. The object itself, however, glowed red and gold and showed a surface pattern like a camouflaged tank. It gave out a continuous, low-pitched buzzing sound. So, Helen describes this object as not being very large. It was about 14 feet across, 4 feet high, and it had a 1 foot wide illuminated band circling around the perimeter. And then she saw movement. There was a short figure, just under 4 feet in height, which was actually approaching her house through the backyard. And she said it was dressed in an olive green, skin-tight suit of a dull material with a helmet of the same material, but with a face piece of non-transparent, orangey, plastic-like substance. That, those are her words. She said it wore white gray boots. It walked along the fence, looking down at the ground, and then at some point climbed over the fence and walked up to the window and only about 10 feet away. She's not sure if uh, it saw her or not. That's not really described in the report. But Helen was amazed to see this figure. She could see that this was not normal, that this was in fact a UFO. So she quickly went to wake her son. They rushed together back to the window. Unfortunately, by this time, the figure was gone and the UFO was no longer on the ground, but looking up, they could see what was apparently the same object moving away from them in the sky. At this point, it was about a mile away, and it moved off into the distance and was gone. That is a pretty brief case, but again, it does involve multiple witnesses and a very unusually described ET with the orange faceplate and the way it climbed over the fence. I thought that was quite unusual. It's a very interesting case, but there's always more <laughs> where these came from. And the next case I'd like to cover occurred in Pennsylvania, more specifically in Presque Isle State Park, Pennsylvania. And I like this case for a number of reasons. It has really outstanding physical evidence in the form of landing traces, a weird substance left at the spot where this craft landed, multiple witnesses, including police officers, actually. And it also is a very unusual sort of Bigfoot, perhaps, type ET. As we shall see, uh, it's definitely not your standard, if there is such a thing, UFO humanoid case. This case occurred on July 31st, 1966, and is probably the most extensive case of the 10 I'm presenting here. It involves a lot of witnesses, but initially it was six people from Jamestown, New York, who had traveled to Presque Isle State Park in Pennsylvania, which has actually about seven miles of beach along Lake Erie. The main witnesses are Betty Jean Clem, she's 19 years old at the time, and Douglas J. Tibbetts, who was 16. But they weren't alone. Along with, with them were adults, Gerald LaBelle and Anita Hayfley, and her two infant children. They had all driven onto the beach and actually gotten their car stuck in the sand. So they weren't able to get out, and finally Gerald LaBelle agreed that he would go with others in the park to go get a tow truck. Uh, so the remaining witnesses were staying there in the car when police officers Ralph E. Clark and Robert Loeb Jr. showed up. The witnesses described how they were stuck in the sand and uh, that uh, Gerald was on his way to get a tow truck. So the police officers said that they would return to make sure that everything was right 
but then they left the scene. Now by now it's around 9.30 p.m. and this is when the weirdness began. And I'll just let Betty Jean Clem describe what happened in her own words. As she says, and I quote, We were sitting in the car waiting for help. We saw a star move. It got brighter. It would move fast, then dim. It came straight down. The car vibrated. I know we saw it. We had taken a walk in that area earlier. There was nothing between those trees then. All of a sudden, it was just there. You could see it come down. It was metallic, sort of silvery, and it landed between two trees. It was as big as a house. It sounded like the noise in a telephone receiver, only louder. It lit up the whole woods in the path. It wasn't like a searchlight. There was a light along the ground, along the whole path. Now Betty described the craft as sort of mushroom shaped with a narrow base and an oval top structure with orange, red, and yellow lights on the back. She says it sent down a beam of light as it landed in the woods. And the lights on the craft went on, or more of them, after it had landed in the woods. And this was about 450 feet away from them. Now Douglas Tibbetts said that it looked sort of hexagonal in shape. And he said that there were actually multiple rays of light coming from this object when it landed in the woods. And he said they, quote, moved like they were searching for something. So this object is there in the woods, and uh, it's emitting this light. And this is when the police officers, Clark and Loeb, returned. And the witnesses explained what they had seen, pointed to this light glowing in the woods. And so, Gerald and the two police officers went to investigate. And it was then that Betty says she saw a figure coming out of the woods. It was quite large. Uh, and she told Anita, who was sitting in the back seat, don't look, there's something out there. Now Anita, with her two infant children, became quite frightened, and she huddled down in the back seat and protected her children and did not look outside. But Betty, of course, did, and she described this figure as a dark, featureless humanoid covered with hair. Kind of like an ape, she said, and it was about, she estimates, six feet tall and as she watched this thing it came closer and actually circled the car and then came right up to the car and clawed at the car itself this absolutely terrified her she screamed in terror and pressed down on the car horn not letting go at which point the creature she said lumbered sort of slowly back into the woods and moments later she saw the ufo rise from the woods and disappear and this is when Douglas and the two police officers came running back to the car they did not see the creature apparently they did not see the UFO take off either but as officer Clark says we made it back she was hysterical screaming she said we've got to get out of here I just saw a monster so I said this is enough everybody in the patrol car we're going to the barracks. Now Betty was so frightened at this point she actually tried to run away and the officer had to restrain her and they went to the barracks and Betty she was still completely frightened. She was sweating, her hair was plastered to her head and she refused to even sit with her back to the window. This is how frightened she was. The officers did verify the scratches on the car so at the station, all the witnesses described over again what happened. And afterwards, the, the police and the witnesses returned to the car. This time they were armed and uh, examined the area. There was no UFO visible, no entity at all. And uh, the witnesses returned to the car. Uh, a tow truck was brought to the area and it was towed away. But that's not the end of this case. The next morning, Pennsylvania State Police and Air Force Blue Book Officer Major William S. Hall, pictured here, arrived and found what looked like triangular tripod landing marks. These were 18 inches long, 8 inches deep. There were also weird skid marks. Based on the depth 
of these marks. They estimated that this object weighed somewhere between 750 and 1,000 pounds. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. They also found a sticky substance pooling in the sand. It was colorless, odorless, and again sticky, but it wasn't evaporating. It had apparently been there all day. So uh, samples were collected by Air Force officers uh, who never gave any word on what they found. But one of the police officers very wisely collected a sample himself and he sent it off to a chemist for analysis. And the chemist identified it as silicone. Now radiation detectors were also brought in but found no evidence of radiation. But when researchers converged on this case, and there were quite a few of them, John Keel and others, uh, they found that at least eight people in that area reported seeing a UFO on that night. And it wasn't only that night, three days after the incident, multiple police officers reporting seeing a UFO in this same area. Again, this was heavily investigated. The National Investigative Committee on Aerial Phenomena sent researchers to investigate, and they pretty much wrote it off as a hoax without apparently much investigation at all. Uh, something the witnesses, the police officers disagreed with, as well as investigators from APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. They also conducted a more thorough investigation, and they believed the case to be genuine. And as I said, police officers on the scene also believed the witnesses, as Chief Descanio says, and I quote, I know what people are going to say, but this girl saw something that scared her badly. This is no joke as far as I'm concerned. Now, as I said, uh, Blue Book officers were on the scene, Major William S. Hall, and they were unable to explain this incident and actually listed it as an unknown. This is case number 10798, unidentified. Now, they did mention the possibility that Betty had seen a bear. Uh, of course, most of the witnesses, and certainly her, <laughs> disagree with that. But in the days that followed, this location became a circus. It was, became a magnet for UFO hunters who flocked there in large numbers in hopes of seeing a UFO. And the publicity was never-ending. And in fact, one of the witnesses, Anita Hayfley, ended up moving away, apparently ti tired of the publicity surrounding the event. Now later, Dr. Bertold Schwartz, a psychiatrist, did a psychiatric exam of Betty Clem and absolutely believed her and she came across as a normal competent witness and uh, passed her psychiatric examination. Yeah, there's a lot to be unpacked from that case. I like that it was declared unidentified by Blue Book officers, that they were actually able to analyze the substance left at the site and identify it, that there were so many corroborating witnesses. And of course, it is one of those rare UFO Bigfoot cases, which are really interesting. So yeah, there's a lot to like about that case. And that's why I included it in this compilation. And now we move to the next case. This is also very interesting, a multiple witness case with animal reactions and some physiological reactions as well. And it really got a lot of publicity. This occurred in Cusac, France. And yeah, it's a very interesting case for sure. This next case occurred on August 29 in 1967. Again, it's in a little village called Cusac in France. This is a tiny little village. Uh, but this case caused a huge sensation and therefore was very well investigated. The main witnesses were 13-year-old Francois Delpuche and his little sister Anne-Marie, who was nine years old. They were walking with their little dog, Medor, uh, to retrieve the cows which had wandered off from their farm. So they're walking in a meadow right along Route D57, and Francois was the first to see what he first thought were four children standing behind a hedge on the other side of the road about 120 feet away. 
So he was intrigued by them uh, because they were dark in color. And he climbed up onto a rock to get a better look. And then both he and his little sister Anne-Marie watched these figures and realized that right next to them, landed on the ground, was a large glowing sphere. It was so bright, it was painful for, for them to look at, but they could see that it was resting on four short legs. Or I should say Anne-Marie described this, little legs with sort of pads on the bottom. Francois does not remember that. But they do both recall that these little figures were walking around the base of this sphere. One of them appeared to be bending over and inspecting the ground. Another held a little mirror-like object. Now these were not all the same height, these figures. They were different heights, but all very short, ranging in height from about four to four and a half feet. They were all dressed in what the kids described as shiny black silk. Their arms seemed overly long, though they did have normal sized heads, but they were sort of pointed on top. And Anne Marie said she saw one of the beings in profile, and she said it looked like it had a pointed nose. Neither of them were close enough to see eyes or ears, but they did say they saw what looked like a short tuft of a beard on the chins of these figures. And again, this was a pretty big sphere. They estimated as at least six feet in diameter, luminous silver, and extremely bright, almost too bright to look at. So Francois allegedly called out to the beings, have you come to play with us? Uh, this was disputed in some reports. Uh, whether or not that was said, we don't know. But the beings at this point seemed to be surprised to be observed, and one immediately rose up into the air and seemed to dive head first into the top of the sphere. The kids did not see any windows or openings or doors or anything like this, but it went inside the sphere and shortly after that the second one followed in the same manner and then the third one. Now at this point uh, the sphere was starting to rise and the fourth one floated up and then back down to pick something up off the ground Francois speculates that it might have been the mirror-like instrument, which he thinks it may have dropped. He's not sure. But the sphere was rising upward, and at this point it was making a soft, but sort of piercing, whistling noise. And this last and fourth being rose up, almost 45 feet into the air at this point, and then entered the sphere in the same way the other three had. So this sphere rose up and up, getting even brighter, and started making weird circling motions. At this point, it scared the nearby cows in the area. And as soon as this sphere reached a certain point, the whistling noise completely stopped, and the object started to move off to the southwest. It was moving very quickly uh, at this point. And their little dog, Medor, actually started barking and chasing the sphere at it as it darted away. And at this point, there was another very interesting detail. The witnesses could smell a strong, strange odor, which they likened to sulfur. Now the investigators on the scene speculated that this might have actually been ozone, uh, which I think is a good possibility or probability. At any rate, the sphere disappeared pretty quickly. The kids ran home and were weeping. They told the adults what happened. Uh, the adults called the police and the police arrived right away, went to the scene in time to smell this strange odor. Now they didn't really find any landing traces. However, they did learn that the neighbor, Monsieur Delcher, had heard the loud whistling sound at the time of the sighting. So there is some corroboration to this incident. Again, animal effects as well. Now, neither child was able to sleep for at least two days following this incident. That's how upset they were. And Francois, his eyes watered really badly after this incident and continued to water a few days afterwards. So he had pretty severe eye irritation. That's a physiological effect. So this did get a lot of attention. Uh, some investigators tried to explain this away as a helicopter landing, 
though no one was able to identify any helicopters in that area. And certainly from, based on the description of the witnesses, <laughs> it's nothing like a helicopter. This account did appear in newspapers, and there was, in fact, a full-length book written about the case by researcher Jean-Marc Gillot. Now, as an interesting side note, right near this area is a very famous cave filled with cave art dated around 25 to 30,000 years old. I'm not sure there's any connection there, but I thought it was an interesting sort of side note. The Cusac, France case did generate a lot of publicity. It was published in newspapers. In fact, like I said, there is a full-length book about it. It's a very interesting case and certainly very well known in France. And I like it because it's it's just so unusual the way the ETs uh, entered the craft. Um, there's a lot of really interesting aspects to it. And of course evidence as we've seen in the form of physiological evidence and animal reactions and more. So also the odor, I, f I found that quite interesting. That the craft left behind a strange odor. But let's move to the next case because there's so many. And this next case occurred in Finland, and more specifically in Kanula, Finland. It's probably one of the better known cases in this country. And I like this one for a number of reasons. It's multiple, witness, multiple witnesses, and it has landing traces as well, and a very interestingly described extraterrestrial. This case occurred on February 5th, 1971. It's not a very well-known case, but yeah, I think does definitely deserves to be heard by a wider audience. Again, this occurred in Kanula, Finland, really out in the woods in a pretty remote area. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon and the main witnesses were two forestry workers. One of them was Peter Alaranta. He's 21 years old. And the other witness is Esko Juhani Snek. He was 18. And they were pretty much finishing up their work day, trimming trees out in the woods. And in fact, Peter had just turned off his chainsaw. And this is when he saw a metallic object overhead sort of descending straight down. Now he first noticed it at treetop level. And it was sort of your classic saucer, metallic, right above the treetops. And in moments, it had landed on the ground on four thin, long landing legs. He said each of these legs were about six feet long. And it landed right next to him pretty much. It was about 45 feet away. And he's watching this in absolute amazement. You could see little portholes all around it. Now the other witness, Esco, was still cutting wood. He had his chainsaw on and didn't see it at first. But Peter described this object as about 15 feet wide. And as he's watching it come down, he sees a little opening appearing in sort of the middle of the bottom part of the craft. And as soon as it fully landed, this little opening was completely open. And a short little being floated down in a weird gliding motion. And according to Peter, this being was dressed in a sort of spacesuit type affair, a full body suit green in color with a faceplate and it was really short. He says this was about three feet tall and as soon as it touched the ground it began to walk towards Peter in short sort of stiff-legged steps. Now Peter wasn't really frightened at this point. He was very much intrigued so he also began to step forward and it was at this point that the other witness, Esco, turned around and saw the UFO and the little being. And in fact, he and Peter could see at least three other beings through the portholes of the craft moving around inside. So meanwhile, Peter and this other little being who's outside the craft approach to about within 30 feet of each other. Uh, when they got this close, the being turned around and began to walk slowly back towards the craft. And Peter, feeling sort of emboldened by the behavior of this ET turning around, decided he was going to lunge forward and try and grab this being, which he did. He rushed forward. 
Now the being was about 10 feet from the craft and started to float up or sort of glide back into the air by the time Peter reached him. So Peter lunged forward just in time to sort of grab the being's right foot by the heel. But he immediately let go because he says he got a bad burn on his hand. In fact, this being's suit burned, he said, like hot iron. So Peter at this point stepped back and this little man glided back into the opening and the craft then began to emit this humming or buzzing noise and it rose into the air. And while it's rising into the air, the opening is closing and the landing legs are beginning to retract and it moved upwards and then quickly darted off and was gone. And Peter felt only a small puff of air. He estimates that the entire encounter lasted only about three minutes. But it sure did affect them profoundly because after it was gone, they were both so shocked that they couldn't even speak to each other. They just kind of stood there speechless. And here's another weird effect. Both felt a strange and unusual stiffness all over their body, especially Peter, who was much closer to the craft. And they said it took them about an hour for the stiffness to leave, enough for them to walk around normally. Now looking where the craft had landed, they did see four round prints in a perfect square pattern. It was about six feet to each side. And each print, they estimate, was about one foot in width. And within this square, the snow was melted down to almost a foot deep. And where the being had walked, they did see little round footprints about six inches long with a stride length of less than a foot. So they went home and told their families and friends, pretty much all of who were skeptical. Uh, Peter showed them his badly burned hand, so they didn't know what to think of that. It was a pretty bad burn. According to Peter, it took about two months to fully heal, but both were somewhat traumatized by the incident. In fact, Peter said he became afraid to walk alone at night. And both were very disappointed by the skepticism of those around them, so they pretty much stopped talking about it until researcher Tapani Kuningas heard about it and was able to interview both the witnesses at length. And he was very much impressed as he writes about this case. During the course of the investigation, no details appeared of anything which could have made the story questionable. And in fact, Tapani learned that on the same day, earlier in that morning, there was in fact another witness, a Mr. Penti Pispanen, who was in the same forested area, about seven miles away, and he described seeing a glowing sphere moving at treetop level. He couldn't tell exactly how large it was, but he estimates it was at least three feet across. So I think there's a good chance that he saw the exact same craft. Again, hard to say, but it's certainly an interesting case. I think that's a pretty good case. We don't hear a lot about UFO landings in Finland. I suspect it's common all over the world. We just don't hear about it. But yeah, a very interesting case with multiple witnesses, physiological effects, landing traces, corroborating witnesses. So definitely deserves, I think, to be very well known. And let's move to the next case, which actually occurred in Winchester, England. And uh, this is just a mind-blowing case in so many ways. Uh, while there aren't landing traces specifically, there are some very interesting physiological effects, mental and psychic effects, government involvement, and just some very unusual behavior on the part of the ETs, and certainly very unusual looking ETs. This case occurred on November 14, 1976, and boy, I love this case. It's so weird. This was again in Winchester, England. It was a Sunday evening around 8.50 p.m. when Edwin Pratt, who was 58 years old, and Joyce Bowles, age 42, were traveling by car back to her home. Now Joyce was driving, 
and it was not long after they got on the A272 highway that they both saw this weird orange light overhead. Now it disappeared and reappeared and it looked to Joyce actually like it was diving down toward the road that they were about to turn onto. This is just a few miles from her house. House. Now this is Chilcombe Road. And as soon as they turned onto Chilcombe Road, they said the car began to act strangely. As Joyce says, and I quote, it shuddered and shook as though it was coming to pieces. Now Joyce immediately felt herself losing complete control of the car, which started to careen diagonally across the highway. She felt as, almost as though it was no longer in contact with the asphalt. So she's struggling vainly to control the car, and this is when Edwin grabbed the steering wheel to help, but this was to no avail. Joyce even lifted her foot off the accelerator, but the engine continued to roar loudly, and the car just careened right off the highway and into the grass. And not only was their engine acting strangely, their headlights blazed to about four times their normal brightness. So these are very unusual electromagnetic effects. The engine was still roaring like crazy at this point, so Edwin reached out and yanked the keys from the ignition to stop the engine from roaring, which it did. The car was now stopped, and this is when both Joyce and Edwin got a huge shock because right in front of them, on the highway, about 15 feet in front of them, a UFO had landed. It was a glowing orange cigar-shaped object. It was 15 feet long, covering most of the road, and it was hovering maybe about one foot off of the road. And again, right in front of them, there was this weird fog or vapor swirling around underneath it from what Joyce believed looked like jets or vents coming from beneath the craft. On the top left of this object, there was a large window, and they could see three heads looking out at them. As Joyce says in her own words, we, we realized that three figures were watching us from a window in the cigar. Now without warning, a male figure emerged through the side of the object. They saw no door open or close, no opening. It just sort of walked right through the wall of the craft. And this man was about six feet tall, slender, he wore a silvery suit, crinkly like aluminum foil, said the witnesses, though they did see what looked sort of like a zipper going up the front. They said this man had long blonde hair brushed back from his forehead. He had a dark beard with sideburns. His skin was very pale and clear. At this point, Joyce could hear a, quote, whistling noise. She said it was like a teapot with boiling water, but much softer. Now, presumably, this was coming from either the craft or the man himself. She's not sure. But this man strode towards them quickly in about five steps and reached the right side of the car, the driver's side. This is in England. And he placed one hand on the roof, bent over, and peered directly at them through the side window. And this is when Joyce and Edwin got a real good look at him. They could see that he had a sort of pointed nose and really weird, weird pink eyes, which Joyce said were, quote, like an albino rabbit. Now these eyes had a strange effect on both of them. Joyce said she was so stunned by his appearance and the way he stared at her, and particularly the eyes, that she looked away. And looking away, she said there were weird spots of lights in her eyes, as if she had looked at a bright, bright light. She thought it was this man staring at her that caused this. So she was quite afraid. She scooted back and grabbed Edwin. And she noticed that his clothes were abnormally warm. Meanwhile, of course, Edwin is watching all of this happen, and he felt a strange effect. As he says, and I quote, the man looked at me, and I think transmitted some power which calmed me. I was scared, but when he stared at me with very bright eyes, I began to feel peace and tranquility flooding through me. So, 
This man remained outside of the right window, they said, for a full two minutes, which is a long time. And then at that point, he sort of stood up and walked to the rear of the car. As Joyce says, he peered through my window at the dashboard controls, then walked to the back of the car, and then he and the cigar simply disappeared. So Joyce is terrified at this point, but Edwin is strangely calm. He wanted to get out of the car and see where the man went, if he could see where this craft went. But Joyce begged him not to. She was still so frightened. Edward, Edwin offered to drive, but Joyce refused. She didn't want to exit the car so they could change seats. So she tried to start the car, and the engine did roar to life. But when she tried to press the accelerator, the car would not move. She said it was as if it was hitting an invisible wall. Now investigators later wondered if this, cra if this car was possibly stuck in the wet mud in the grass off the highway. Whatever the cause, the wheels spun uselessly and the engine stalled. So Joyce started the car again, and this time she was able to maneuver the car back onto the highway, which I think lends credence to the, what she said, that there was something holding the car back. At any rate, once they left the immediate vicinity, Joyce stopped the car, <laughs> shakily lit a cigarette to calm her nerves, and continued the short drive to her home, which was only a few minutes away. Uh, Edwin, some time later, drove back alone, and as he passed the spot where this whole ordeal had happened, he saw the tracks where their car had, quote, jumped from the road. He was too nervous to stop, and in fact, he says he drove at a higher speed than he normally would. He no normally never speeds, but he says on this night he did. Meanwhile, more weird effects began to occur. Edwin says that he felt the same unusual calmness and felt it for a full week following this incident. Joyce, however, felt the opposite. She said that she was unable to eat for three days and was very shaken and anxious. And in fact, a rash appeared on the right side of her face, perhaps related to her anxiety. Uh, the car, now this is so weird, the car itself seemed to perform better. And Joyce said she no longer needed to use the choke to get it started. She also noticed that the watch she had worn during this incident started running faster and no longer kept accurate time. And finally, she says that she felt like, quote, a different person and that she had a new inner strength within her. And again, not over yet. Six days following this incident, Joyce says she received a strange call from an anonymous gentleman who warned her not to speak of the incident and that she would soon be visited by a man from the government. She was not happy about this. She basically told him off and hung up the phone. He called again, and she hung up on him. Now, by this time, she had been talking to investigators, and no government man ever showed up, though Joyce did notice that her phone was acting peculiarly, and it would tinkle every time she terminated a call, which it had not done before. Now, investigators questioned her extensively, and they learned that she had experienced poltergeist-like activity since childhood, which was quite pronounced including objects being moved around or flying through the air. She frequently saw apparitions of a ghostly nun. wasn't just her, actually. Other members of her house also saw it. But Joyce says that she does have the ability to do psychic healing, hands-on healing. And she says that, in fact, the energy in her hands builds up. And if she doesn't use her ability, this poltergeist-like activity increases. Now, investigators did their job, and they learned that there were many other witnesses who saw UFOs on that night, uh, well, but basically that whole week, that night, the day before, and the days after. They found, in fact, seven other groups of people who saw weird UFOs, and even, in one case, this, what appears to be the same entity that Joyce and Edwin saw. Uh, they found out that Miss Sandra Wheeler saw a hovering orange object, as did Norman Boise and his wife. 
They interviewed a Miss Atkinson who was driving home with a car full of people and they saw a large object in the sky with lots of lights on it. There were other witnesses to UFO activity in the area at that time, including Maureen Lovely, Josephine Rose, and her entire family, and another group of witnesses, P.J. Baker, and his friend. But most interesting is the testimony which comes from Mr. and Mrs. Haynes, who said that they saw this really strange silver-suited man standing near the Chandler's Ford Hypermarket. This was only about seven miles distant from the encounter location. Whether or not that's the same entity is hard to say, but it's certainly intriguing. I think you'll agree that was a very dramatic case with you know, so many weird parts to it. The ET is so unusual, the way it acted, um, the effect on the car, what we would call electromagnetic effects, uh, but the psychic effects as well, with one witness feeling an extraordinary sense of peace and the other having all this psychic stuff going on. It's a really interesting case. And also that weird sort of men in black aspect is also very interesting. And of course the corroborating witnesses, so much UFO activity from going on that other people witnessed and apparently other people witnessed the actual entity as well. So it's a very well verified case. Next case I'd like to talk about is a really interesting case. This one occurred in a really small town in Elgin, Scotland. I like this case for a number of reasons. There are two witnesses. They're both little girls, but they're not the only witnesses. They're the only ones who saw the humanoid but there's other supporting witnesses who help corroborate this case. And uh, there's some interesting landing traces as well. Some other very peculiar elements involving what appear to be threats to the witnesses. And yeah, just some very weird elements that I think make this case deserve to be better known. This next case occurred on May 18, 1977. The town of Elgin is a small town near Moray, Scotland, and it was around 6.30 p.m. on May 18 when two 10-year-old girls, their names are Karen McLennan and Fiona Morrison, they were just playing in the fields outside their homes on near 27 Robertson Drive. This was in the Thornhill housing estate. At that time, it was very... Uh, rural and not populated now of course it's packed with homes but they heard this soft humming noise coming from the woods next to them and they could tell that this was a very unusual noise so they went to investigate the source and this is when they came upon a long cylindrical shaped object with rounded ends and a dome on top now this was pretty large they estimate it was about 30 feet long was polished metal and it had a red rotating band around the circumference and a bright red light on top of the dome. Now this object wasn't directly on the ground but close enough. It was hovering about two feet at most above the ground. And it was pretty close. The girls they estimate were about 1200 feet away, a little less. And as they observed this object they saw a tall thin man with very long arms standing right alongside the object. They estimate he was about six feet in height and he was dressed all in silver. And Karen says it looked as though this silver suit had what looked like buttons running down the front. She couldn't be sure. But they were quite alarmed by his strange appearance and his craft, especially when he began to move towards them. And when that happened, they both turned and ran. Mind you, these, they are both 10 years old. So after running away for about 30 seconds, they stopped and turned around. The man was no longer visible, and the craft itself began to take off. And it took off in a pretty unusual way. It moved straight up, then moved off to the left, then up and to the left again, and repeated this step-like maneuver one more time. And once it had reached a certain height, it shot off straight up at super high speeds, so fast they couldn't really track it. So the girls were amazed. They ran and told their parents. 
Now, meanwhile, their parents, Caroline McLennan and Maureen Morrison, had both heard the strange humming noise and thought it was peculiar but did not look outside to investigate. Now, Caroline, one of their mothers says, and I quote, I do not suppose I would have believed, believed them had it not been for the fact that I also heard a strange humming noise, just like a vacuum cleaner, at the same time they were out playing. Several of our neighbors also said that they had heard the strange noise coming from the woods. So this is very significant. This absolutely brings more credence to the children's testimony. So the next day they went to examine the landing location and they found a circle, a circular area of about 100 yards in diameter showing what they believed were damaged to the trees and singed vegetation. Now interestingly it was that same morning, the next morning, uh, that this was 12 hours after the girls sighting, another neighbor said that she heard that same strange whistling noise again. So, the police were called and the story made its way to UFO researchers pretty quickly. They collected samples of the burned leaves and uh, strangely these samples were lost in the mail. So they thought that that might be significant. And after this case was published in newspapers, because it did get some publicity, the mother of one of the children, Caroline McLennan, says she also received a weird phone call from an unidentified male who spoke in a weird monotonous tone of voice and he threatened her not to tell anyone about the sighting if she valued the life of her daughter. In fact, he said, you will do exactly as I tell you. Do you hear me? And she received this same call several times. Police were again called. They were not able to trace the call. Uh, and understandably, Caroline was very upset about this and for some time afterwards, escorted her daughter to and from school. And that's not the end of this case because following this incident, she said in the weeks following it, she repeatedly saw strange lights in the forest very close to where the girls had seen this apparent craft land. Yeah, an interesting case for a number of reasons. I really wonder what did happen to those landing traces that were sent in the mail. Uh, in fact, they stopped doing that, these UFO organizations, because so many traces, physical evidence, were being mysteriously, quote, lost. <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to say whether that's an accident or not, but it having happened a number of times certainly makes you wonder. But yeah, a very cool case and one that I think has some interesting insights to the nature of the UFO phenomena, particularly how the UFO moved. I also found that very interesting as well. And the next case I'd like to talk about actually occurred in Italy, more specifically in San Giorgio di Nogaro, Italy. And this is another super interesting case in which a UFO landed, of course, and an ET came out. And I like this one because it does have landing traces. And while there is a single witness to the entity, turns out there are other people who saw the actual craft itself. And again, this did affect the witness uh, very profoundly in terms of how he reacted emotionally. It's an important case. This case occurred on September 18, 1978, and the main witness is a railway employee. His name is Giorgio Filipputi. He was 47 years old at the time, married and enjoying a normal life, and he decided he would go on a little fishing expedition along the Corno River. And this would change his life forever. Because as he sat along the river fishing, he heard this oddly piercing whistling noise. Now he knew there was a steel factory nearby on the Ossa Corno Road, and his first thought was that the noise was coming from there. But at the same time, he felt a rush of air, and was strong enough to cause the surface of the water in the river to become disturbed. 
He also heard a dog off in the distance begin howling like mad. So puzzled, he decided he would leave his spot on the river to go investigate. And I'll just quote him directly, as Giorgio says in his own words, No sooner had I reached the top of the embankment that I was terrified, literally terrified, at the sight of an exceedingly unusual object standing on a small, dry mud flat covered with short vegetation. It was like a sort of egg, like something disc-shaped. It was four or five meters wide, and it had a cupola on top. It was supported on three thick legs, about one and a half meters high. So this object, said Giorgio, was totally smooth. There were no visible portholes, doors, lights, or markings of any kind. He said it was a kind of a shiny, brassy color and definitely looked metallic. Now at this point, it was about 60 feet away from him and it was still making a soft whistling noise as it stayed there. And as he was studying its strange appearance, he says a figure stepped out from behind it. At this point, he's still thinking it's some sort of weird government craft or something. But according to Giorgio, this figure was a male no taller than four feet, and looked somewhat Asian in appearance. And as Giorgio says in his own words, he was wearing a completely tight-fitting overall of the color and brightness of silver, which flashed and sparkled vividly in the sunlight, and which left only the front part of the head, from the forehead to the chin, exposed. On his feet, he had boots of the height of those worn by paratroopers and of a smoky black color. His face, dark bronzed, had almond-shaped eyes extending back towards where his ears would be, which I did not see because that part of the head was covered by the overall. The nose and mouth were quite normal. So now he's getting a little bit alarmed. This jumpsuit reminded Giorgio of silvery, fish scales. He said the figure also had white gloves and there were small sort of cartridge-like cases attached to its waist. So he was becoming more and more alarmed as he slowly realized that this figure was not human. And as he says in his own words, I was overcome by a profound emotional disturbance due partly to this stupefaction and partly due to fear for the thing had taken me totally by surprise. I found it absolutely impossible to figure out this complicated situation in which I now found myself. So his first thought was to retreat, run away, but he also noticed that this strange figure seemed surprised to see Giorgio himself, and this made him hesitate, and apparently made the ET hesitate too, because, as Giorgio says, when he became aware of my presence, he halted for a few moments, probably reassured by the fact that I was displaying ungovernable fear. So this figure kept his gaze locked on Giorgio. Giorgio did the same. This figure dashed around the saucer and began fiddling with what Giorgio describes as sort of a horseshoe-shaped device on the side of the craft. And in fact, Giorgio had a distinct impression that the figure was trying to conduct some sort of repairs on the craft itself. And this lasted for about five minutes, at which point the figure walked out of view behind the craft. Seconds later, the craft emitted a loud rumbling noise, followed by an increasing pitch of the whistling noise, and this craft slowly rose vertically. Once it had reached a few feet off the ground, the landing gear retracted into the craft. A bluish glow came from beneath the craft, followed by a long tongue of flame. And he says, when it reached a height of about 30 feet, the craft, which had been horizontal, actually turned on edge and darted away. As Giorgio says, it was, quote, comparable to a missile, meaning its speed. He says it, quote, was out of sight in a few seconds. I find this interesting because we do see a lot of cases where a craft will turn up and then assume a vertical position and dart away. 
Uh, I don't think he would have known about that. So I think that lends more credence to his uh, story. So he went to examine where this craft had landed, and he found three circular imprints in the mud. Each was just under two feet wide. He was utterly amazed. So he began searching the area around this uh, location, hoping to find someone else who had also witnessed the event. And he did find another fisherman who did not see the event and also who did not believe him, even when Giorgio showed him the landing imprints. So he was still shook up, and the other fishermen agreed to accompany him to a nearby bar on the Ossa Corno Highway, where Giorgio wanted to have a drink. And as they sat down, they were both amazed to hear another patron at the bar describe just having seen a brightly lit object speed across the sky. So this first fisherman turned to Giorgio and said that he now totally believed him. <laughs> it's an interesting case. Uh, now despite this, Giorgio was so upset that he kept the experience initially secret, even from his family. He stopped fishing and refused to go outside of his house except to go to work. It would very much upset him. And he didn't want to tell anyone about it until finally his brother, Angiolino, was able to extract the story out of Giorgio and persuaded him to publicly share his story, which he did. And it was published in newspapers, and this is how UFO researchers also found out about it. What a case. Yeah, that's a really interesting case. The witness feels like the UFO occupant had landed to perhaps repair his craft. I don't know. That's obviously pure speculation. But it's an important case for, I think, the reasons we saw. It's got landing traces. It's got multiple witnesses. He was so close to it. There's no possible chance of misperception. It's just, I love these cases. They're so fascinating. And here is another equally interesting case which occurred in Jurina, Spain. And I like this one because it involves multiple witnesses again, landing traces as well. Uh, and it's just a fascinating case of a UFO landing and a UFO occupant seen up close by the witnesses. This case occurred on November 24, 1978. And again, this is Jurina, Spain. Uh, there were five men out hunting southwest of Jurina. This is on the La Pisana estate. It was on November 24, 1978, at around 3.30 a.m. This is just east of the Guadiamar River. So they were all out there hunting in the woods, and one of the men decided he was going to return to the car, but the other four were still interested in hunting, so they decided that they would walk into this area, which was wooded with eucalyptus trees. And one of the men, his name is Manuel Gordillo, he was the first to notice these weird red lights in the forest. Now there were some dirt roads in this area and he thought that it might be car tail lights. But then another one of the men was looking at the lights and he said, Hey, what is that? In my mother's name, in my grandmother's name, what is that? That is a strange thing. So at this point these lights were on the ground, but pretty far off in the distance on the other side of the river. All the men had powerful flashlights, so they walked closer and saw more lights. They decided they would get closer, so they crossed the river. Now, at this point, they lost sight of the lights. They didn't really think that much of it at this point uh, and continued hunting. They wandered off a little bit from each other until they saw the lights again. In fact, it was the other three men who saw them much closer, and they rushed together and called Manuel over, and they began to talk about it. And as Manuel says, I told them, are we going to get closer? They were very scared. The red light there was doing a strange thing, as if it were shaking. Then I told them, watch me from behind. I'm going to get a little closer. So he was the most courageous of the group, Two of the other men were too scared to venture forward, but the third, his name is Francisco Lopez Rivero, decided he would follow slowly behind Manuel. 
So the two of them walked up to within 90 feet of these lights and they could now see that this was in fact an object on the ground with rows of colored lights on it. These lights were red, orange, yellow, and green and on top of this object there was a bright red light. The object itself was quite strange in shape. They likened it to a sort of vase or jar. They estimated it was about 9 feet tall, 12 feet wide, and walking around it was a tall, strong-looking figure. Now, they couldn't see him very well in the dark, but they could see that he was wearing dark boots, silvery clothes, and a helmet with a faceplate that was much like a motorcycle helmet. And as they watched him, they later estimated his height at nearly 7 feet tall. So as soon as they got this close, the man started to walk slowly towards them, making this sort of weird humming noise. And he actually approached them to within about 30 feet. At this point, the two men, Manuel and Francisco, became very frightened. But the figure turned around and went back to the craft. And then it approached the same distance again. It appeared to pick something off the ground and returned to the craft, this time going inside it. And as Manuel says in his own words, I was a little afraid, and I thought of my wife and my children, so I didn't feel very safe. Finally, we got out of there very scared. We no longer felt like hunting, so we left running. And in fact, Manuel ran so hard, he tumbled into the other people, knocking them over. And after that, they ran to their car and left the scene. It was about one and a half months later that investigators heard about this case and returned with Francisco to the scene and found what they believe were footprints from the figure. These footprints measured about 16, 17 inches long. And investigator Antonio Moya Serpa actually sat down with Francisco and drew the craft and figure. And Francisco approved the drawing as being as accurate as he remembered seeing. I can only imagine what it must have been like to be that close to a UFO and occupant, so I don't blame the witnesses for running away in fear, though I don't think there's any evidence <laughs> that the ET was there to hurt them. I mean, it was just approaching, nothing more than that. But what a case. And there's always more where that came from. The last case I'd like to cover today occurred actually in Norway. And the city, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, is Stjordal. Uh, this is a single witness case in terms of who... Well, actually, no. There are multiple witnesses to this case. Animal reactions as well. Uh, but the main witness, she's the only one in her family who saw it. She observed it through binoculars. I loved that, not only the craft, but the being itself. And uh, also what's interesting about this case is it occurred during daylight hours. Uh, a number of these cases have, but that is somewhat unusual. At any rate, it's got some very interesting aspects to it, as we shall see. It was July 25, 1981. And again, this case occurred, at, let me see, Stjordal, Norway. This is a brief case, but quite interesting. And I like it because it came from the Norwegian Institute for Scientific Research and was also reported to APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. The main witness is Miss Hjordis Hockstad. It was 7.30 a.m. in the morning and everyone else in her house was asleep. She was sitting at the kitchen table drinking coffee and looking out the window hoping to spot some deer, which did occasionally appear, and instead she was shocked to see a metallic gleaming coming from less than 1,000 feet away in the field. Now it was partially obscured by bushes, so she wanted to examine it further and was looking at it, trying to figure out what this could be, and her attention was diverted to a strange figure of a man walking near this gleaming object. She said it was very short. He was dressed in a gray-brown, what looked like a boiler suit, which is a full-body suit. It covered him from head to toe. 
She said it was very bulky, like a, quote, spacesuit. She said it seemed to have the hood of an anorak. This is sort of a coat that Eskimos wear. Or, well, other people wear it, but it's a type of coat. Now, she couldn't see his face as he had his back to her, but he was walking in this strange sort of, quote, rolling gait. It reminded her, she said, of an astronaut on the moon. So she's watching him and trying to figure out what's going on, and she decided she'd grab her binoculars. She had a pair of 12 by 50 binoculars, and she was able to get a closer look at this figure, and more specifically, this object. And as she watched, this object eventually rose from the ground, and the man was gone at this point, and this object moved steadily and silently actually towards her, moving directly over her home. So she got a pretty good look at it. She could now see it was cylindrical with a globe-like structure on top. A metal bar protruded from the bottom of the cylinder and she could see what she describes as a quote plate or a marking. It was red in color and in the general shape of a heart, she thought. And she thought there might be symbols of some kind on this plate, but she really couldn't be sure of that. The whole experience lasted about 15 minutes minutes and then it was over. This object was gone. She did report the experience to the local newspapers who alerted the Norwegian Institute for Scientific Research. They sent people over to inspect the landing site with a Geiger counter. No radiation was found. However, the tops of some nearby shrubs were blackened as though exposed to high heat and they also found crushed vegetation. And they also learned that the cows adjacent to the Hockstad's house had exhibited unusual restlessness during the time of the encounter. So they interviewed the farmer who had the cows, and he says that he actually saw this craft come in for a landing. Uh, I don't know if he saw it take off or if he saw the being itself, but he did say that it took two hours before his cows calmed down. An interesting end note to this case is it took place only five miles from the very famous Hestelin Valley. This is an area which has been known for decades upon decades for strange light activity. There you go, another amazing case. I wish there was more information about the other witness and what he saw, but that's just not included in the report on the case that I could find. Uh, but again, not only uh, is, are there multiple witnesses, but there's apparent landing traces, animal reactions. It's amazing that people are still skeptical of events like these because they do have physical evidence, many forms of it, as we have seen. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to put this presentation together for you today, because it shows a number of things, that this is an ongoing phenomena, have been occurring for decades upon decades upon decades, also interesting is it's all over the world, North America, South America, all across Europe from top to bottom, Australia. Uh, and of course, these events are going on everywhere in the world. And the vast majority of them are simply not reported. So I think it's far more common than people realize. And as you can see, a good number of these cases do have multiple witnesses. Uh, little children are seeing these things, older people, people of all ages, doesn't really matter your ancestry, your, your gender, education, all the other th things that we use to define or label ourselves. Uh, it shows that we are all people throughout this universe. All these people are seeing humanoids. And it's very interesting to see their descriptions because while they vary widely, they also have incredible commonalities. So thanks very much. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Again, my name is Preston Dennett, and I want to thank you very much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers, keep looking for the truth, and most important of all, keep having fun.